you are what everybody needs in their life. Absolutely. Like literally, that's exactly <laughs> what we need. We all need a Mary Christine in our life. For women, I think the standards of, of beauty has sure changed over the years, but it's still um, primarily the same foundation, right? We want to be accepted. And what's the root of accepting? We want to always look a certain way, be a certain way, based on other people's standards. He's an athlete. He looks in shape, but funnily enough, he doesn't feel in shape. Yeah, he feels so... like when he looks in the mirror, this is what you see, but he feels completely different. You'd be surprised. Um, I've met a lot of and worked with a lot of people that are looking incredible on the outside, mm. but actually have uh, various different types of uh, gut-related issues. Mm. Not just even that, just mental issues. Yeah. You know, like they are going through bouts of depression, Yeah. Uh, uncontrollable amounts of anxiety. Mm. They don't know how to deal with that. What do you do for your clients when they come to you and they say, for example, I'm always sick and I'm bloated and I'm breaking out? The number one thing I get them to do because it is an internal problem is I get them to do a blood test. Now, because we're so different, each one of us, and uh, our gut microbiome is so bio-individual, um, the blood tests are never the same. So it varies it depends on the severity of the problem of, of each person that I work with. So I get those tests done and after I get the test results back, I understand a little bit more about what's going on in their, in their gut microbiome, but that isn't always enough. Hi guys, welcome to a new episode of Untempered. I have personally been looking forward to this episode so much. Today I have the pleasure of speaking with Mary Christine. Mary Christine is a certified clinical nutritionist and gut health expert. She's renowned for transforming the lives of many and combining scientific expertise with a holistic approach to guide individuals towards optimal health and vitality. And I have the pleasure of meeting you a couple of weeks ago and I was like, you are everybody, you are what everybody needs in their life. Absolutely. Like literally, <laughs> that's exactly what we need. We all need a Mary Christine in our life. Yeah. So tell me, how, why gut health? Like, how did, how did you start up with that? You know, um, I think as teenagers, we all have had several types of gut health issues, I would say, in a sense that um, maybe it stems back to wanting to be accepted and eating disorders and, and wanting to feel and look our best. And, and um, perhaps maybe back in the day, we didn't have so much of social media, but being at school where... A lot of the students uh, wanted to just fit in and they always wanted to look beauty, beautiful, right? So uh, for women, I think the standards of, of beauty has sure changed over the years, but it's still um, primarily the same foundation, right? We want to be accepted. Mm. And what's the root of accepting? We want to always look a certain way, be a certain way based on other people's standards. Right. So um, what does that stem to? So we try to restrict the one thing we can, which mm -hmm. is food. Right. Right. So and you end up having unhealthy habits rather than. Absolutely. We right. end up having very unhealthy habits because we want to obviously fit in. So um, my whole um, perception or my whole story when it came to gut health is that my own eating disorders when I was younger, it started wow. when I was 18. Mm. So I really wanted to fit in. I wanted to uh, make sure that I, I stood out. I uh, wanted to. Uh, always look my best. I wanted to be the thinnest in the crowd and and look the prettiest. And uh, very early on, I suffered with like most teenage women do, and even and even boys is yeah. cystic acne. Oh, wow. you know, yeah. so that's like a big thing for all of us. You know, it goes all the way up until adulthood. And what are the things that we, we be, become less confident about is the way we look in our skin, right? Absolutely. So if things that we can control there, we start stop eating. So how did that affect you being having a, an eating disorder and cystic acne at 18? I bet that was really, really hard. Yeah, it was tough because, you know, back in the days and in, in the 80s, I'd mm -hmm. say, yeah. in early 90s even, um, I would say like in general, we didn't really have the digital age that we have today. So all the information mm -hmm. that we have right now is not the same information that we have back then. And, and sure, our parents and that generation is very different in terms of upbringing than in what it is today. So yeah, because what kind of advice were you getting? Really? Right, yeah. absolutely. We didn't get that kind of nutrition knowledge at school. We weren't really getting the kind of right information at, at at home. So we just had to find different ways to deal with that. So whatever our parents would tell us in terms of stop eating fried food or take your probiotics. Sure, I was doing that to an extent, but I still had them. 
I had hormonal acne, so cystic acne, definitely. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, whenever I got my period, I would I would get it. So yeah. um, it definitely like uh, destroyed my confidence, and uh, I just didn't want to go through these hormonal uh, outbursts. And then it was um, definitely in my uh, early twenties when I started really diving deep into trying to understand. Why am I still getting this in in my in my early twenties? When my friends started clearing up their skin in their early twenties, yeah, you know, because obviously you hit puberty, mm-hmm. you know, you, you you get menopause, you start developing all these uh, certain aspects to um, our bodily functions, mm-hmm. um, and you see others, and you're like, you know, it's obviously genetics play a role in that. So you obviously see your other friends and they're not having them anymore. And you're like, what is the root cause of these problems? Why am I still getting that? So I went to doctors after doctors, to dermatologists, to gastroenterologists, just to try to figure out like, what's the root cause of these problems? And what do they give you? They prescribe you medication, right? right? They prescribe you various different type of Roaccutane, Dacutane, Mm -hmm. um, a lot of different things that basically... Sure, um, helps control the impact of acne, but at the same time, it's not treating the root cause of the problem and only the the, the symptom, right? Right. So and causing side effects as well. Massive side, side effects. effects. So yeah. have you ever tried it? Um, I was put on different kind of medication that did have ridiculous side effects on me, and birth control never ever, you know, never ever was good for my body, and that's kind of like how, as what you're telling me is classic. Western medicine let you down. And I feel like in a way it's let me down as well in different aspects. So yeah, I totally agree. Absolutely. So did you ever uh, have acne when you were growing up? I didn't have acne. No, I didn't have acne. Like I didn't have cystic acne, but I had different kind of hormonal um, issues. Uh, My periods were extremely heavy and painful. And I would get these like head ringing the front migraines um, around my period where I couldn't even get out of bed. Absolutely. So yeah. it's funny that you say that because my sister, for example, she's the only one in our family. We're three girls who has that problem, the same as yours. Mm. And it's crazy because you grow up in the same family, but people don't realize we have all extremely unique Genetics. microbiomes. Oh, microbiome, microbiomes. Yeah. Our gut microbiota, regardless of our genetics, our ethnicities, environmental factors, they're all very different. So you can grow up in the same home with the same DNA, but have completely different gut microbiomes. And that's why we need to understand it, right? Because I saw a study that did, um, it was a study done on twins and one of them got cancer and one of them didn't. And everybody was so confused because they're twins. And this is kind of where it originated, where we're all still built so differently that if we don't understand our body down to our microbiomes, then how are we going to be able to prevent disease? Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. So... So um, what was the biggest change you did to my, get, I mean, obviously your skin is stunning now, but thank what, you. Was the, what was the the um, gradual change that you did? You know, this is a secret that I don't really tell a lot of people, <laughs> but this is what's helped me, but kind of like, not just in my 20s, but later on throughout the years, like, because I was still getting it even till my like mid 30s. And it was really in my mid 30s when I stopped getting hormonal acne or any mm-hmm. form of stress acne or any kind of acne, right? It's really uh, removing eggs from my diet. Eggs? Absolutely, wow. eggs. Now, why how eggs? did you find that? Was it intolerance test or you just kind of no, did a trial? No, I, I actually didn't do an intolerance okay. test, but uh, with research, mm-hmm. um, with various different uh, science-based information out there, you try and test different things that work and don't work, right? Right. And there was a, a, a massive study that heavily spoke about what eggs do to your body uh, when you have already SIBO or uh negative pathogens or bad bacteria is that it feeds into these bad bacteria. Oh, wow. So if you're someone that has really bad bacteria already that is lurking in there, that leads to leaky gut, inflammation, hormonal acne, various different types of of menstrual cramps and so on, um, eggs actually is a culprit to that, which means it feeds into that. Which, But the thing is, most of us eat eggs. Right. Oh every my God, single day. Every single day. <laughs> every single day. Yeah. And people don't realize that if you have this particular bacteria that you haven't healed from, you're just feeding into it day in, day out. Hence why you're constantly breaking out. Wow, that is so interesting. Yeah. And so many people actually, I read this online and I was like, I need to run this by you. But it said that most people who think that, who aren't actually celiac, for example, who think that they're allergic to um, or intolerant to gluten or lactose intolerant are, are wrong. They think that, but really it's actually other things that are, like you said, are feeding into the back. Is it passage? What is yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. 
and they but don't notice it. So they bacteria. say, oh, I'm gluten free or, you know, I'm going to try a gluten free yeah. diet because of this, but they're actually removing the wrong things. Absolutely. Um, now I work with a lot of people with celiac okay. or, or problems and with gluten intolerance. And they definitely have obviously the, the major, yeah. major side effects, right? I think a lot of the times, you know, uh, not to say anything negative about modern medicine, but mm. there's a lot of misdiagnosis out there. Of course. So you go to a doctor and they, you know, um, do a bunch of different tests and they prescribe you a bunch of different pills, but then they're actually treating something completely different from what you have. Wow. And that aggravates your liver your kidneys functions and your gut microbiome because a constant consumption of antibiotics, just like birth control pills, is causing a havoc in your gut health, right? Yes. So like you said, people who may have been diagnosed celiac or maybe aren't have celiac. Right. Maybe they have something completely different, but then they haven't done the right tests to figure out what those are. And they're taking a prescription drugs based on things that they don't actually have, which is causing more havoc than good. And an overconsumption of that by year in, decades, what does that do to your liver? Oh my gosh. Yeah, yeah. It completely, it completely destroys your liver. It makes it a sluggish liver. It makes it impossible to digest foods well. It makes it difficult to, it's like, um, let's just say you have a, a really nice car and in the really nice car, you're not constantly oiling that car, right? What, what tends to happen to the engine? You're destroying that engine. Right. It's the same with the liver, right? If you're cons consistently, um, not giving it the right kinds of things that it needs to regenerate, repair, heal daily, what tends to happen to that? Right. It becomes Weathers. it becomes mm -hmm. bruised. It becomes yeah. destroyed. It needs to go in for work. And this is so interesting. And again, after sitting with you now, it's been probably eight minutes, but last time I saw you, we were at a coffee shop and you gave me so much information that was so well worded. And I was like, oh my God, why have I never heard this from a doctor? And for whatever issues I've had for my personal experience, I've always seen this doctor and this doctor, this doctor, and I've had two colonoscopies because they were trying to find, find out why I was so bloated and I would eat and then knock out. I would go to sleep. Like whatever it was I would eat, my body would just be like shut down. And they did colonoscopy. They said, you're fine. Maybe you have IBS and all these things. And then I met you. And within the first hour that we were together, you said, try fasting. And by the way, I haven't told you this, but I did try it. Oh, cool. And I did. And Congrats. I started a little bit by like intermittent and then making it a little bit longer. And when I was really low on energy, I had a ginger shot. You didn't tell me to do that, but I just kind of was like. I love ginger uh, shots. Right? <laughs> it, I don't know what it is about They're it. Like, incredible for the it, gut. Yes. Yeah. I could feel like, you know, if I had a little bit of nausea or stomach because I'm not eating, but it did clear out my stomach. It's weird. Like within three, four, five days of doing this, obviously it was rough. I felt like I weighed less, like my body was he like less heavy on the ground, if that makes yeah, sense. Yeah, absolutely. And did you feel less bloated as well? Less bloated. And I was like, oh my God, she's amazing. How many hours did you do? So I started intermittent 13, then okay. I went to 15. Okay. And then one day I did water only, which was really, really tough. And I knew that you said that people do it for 10 days at a time. I tried my best. So I was like, I'm going to try my best. But the actual full day of water and ginger and really cleansing was like three or four days. That's incredible. But it was, it was definitely hard, but I, I would never, I would say if I knew now how I was going to feel after, I would have just powered through even harder. Does that yeah, make sense? Yeah, totally. But, yeah. but that goes to show, let's go back to the topic of intermittent fasting mm. and the fact that the impact that intermittent fasting has on our uh, human body is just incredibly healing. Tell us a little bit more about it because some sure. people might be listening and be like, what's intermittent fasting? Yeah, so, How does it work? What does so it do? intermittent fasting is just really putting your bodies to a longer fasting window than the time that you're consuming foods. So for example, my clients, I love to put them on the 16-8. So they are um, fasting for 16 hours and they're consuming foods within an eight hour eating window. Mm -hmm. Now, why that's incredible is because think about it though, our bodies are not meant to consume 24 uh, foods 24 seven. Right. Right. We're not a human garbage disposal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Although Which, we act like it, the snacking although, and in although, the car. Although and, we do act like it, but mm -hmm. you know, in all fairness to, to the people out there, it's also cu cultural uh, expectations, demands, upbringing, uh, societal ways of, of, of um, feeding this into us, into believing that this is the norm. So in reality, it's not even just that they don't know any better. They just haven't been fed with the right information. And that's why they think that this is the right path. So when it comes to intermittent fasting, if we're putting our bodies on a level of 
uh, starvation, mm -hmm. which you're not giving our bodies enough um, um, foods that we're consistently eating with high fat, high sugar, high, high carb, ultra high processed. We're giving our bodies enough reason to feed the bad bacteria, to eat mm -hmm. the, the good bacteria, to eat in the bad bacteria. You know, and you're consistently doing that. You're allowing your body to repair, to regenerate. You're giving your liver enough time to digest the foods you just ate. Yeah. You know, because exactly. people are eating three hours, two hours later, they're eating another something else. Mm. You know, two hours before they go to the gym, they're eating something. An hour after they're consuming something. They, they're snacking at midnight. Mm. And I found like, weirdly, hunger was addictive. I don't know if that makes sense, but I'll explain what I mean. I felt like if I'm hungry, then I eat, then I'm hungry again, then I eat, then I'm hungry again. I love that. I, right? I love that. I have an explanation for that. <laughs> really? Yeah. Because when I did the fasting, uh, it, after I kind of t taught my body that, hey, you're taking a break, it felt like, wait a minute, I'm actually not hungry. Yeah, absolutely. So that is uh, another benefit of intermittent fasting is that it totally reduces um, your hunger cravings. Mm. Now, why are we always hungry? Why? What's your theory? <laughs> I don't, I think because we're eating the wrong foods, which then tell our body that we need something more nutritious. I don't know. That's just. Okay. Now the reason why uh, we're always hungry mm. is because every time we're consuming foods and we're eating the wrong kinds of foods, these are based on various different factors, right? Uh, what we enjoy eating, which is primarily processed foods, right. uh, the stress levels that we have every single day and we're not managing those stresses. Uh, what tends to happen is then we're craving for high sugar, uh, high fat foods to help us cope with that from an emotional standpoint. Yes. Right. And when we're consuming high sugar, high fat, ultra high process, it spikes our blood glucose levels. Okay. Now the spike of blood glucose levels, which is a, a spike mm. because you're feeling great and you are hit with serotonin and dopamine levels from the foods that you're eating. Yeah. Right. The reward and the pleasure hormones right. from the foods that you're consuming, what goes up must come down. Yes. And then you crash. And then massively. you crash. Yeah. So the crash is what makes you feel hungry again mm. because you're eating the wrong kinds of food. However, if you're consuming the right kinds of food, there are no glucose, um, there are no crashes because your glucose levels are always stable. Hence why people who are constantly consuming nutrient dense foods, fruits and vegetables, antibiotic free, anti hormone free foods, uh, anti pro, um, um, non-processed foods mm. are always in a state of stabilizing their glucose levels, which means that they're not always constantly craving for foods. That's the reason why you are always on this hunger train. Right. Hunger train, literally. Yeah. This is incredible. Again, something that doctors don't tell you. I no. feel like they wait till things go wrong. And uh, there's a heart surgeon that I've just listened to his podcast. And he was saying that he's had somebody on his table that was 28 years old and she had two kids and she died. And he was like, how did her doctor allow her to have high cholesterol for so long for eating processed foods to the point where her arteries were blocked and didn't really give her enough warning that she actually got to this point. And this is why this is specifically why I really wanted you to come on this podcast because I think people need to now search for something different. They need to search for a Mary rather than search for the doctor in the white coat that can, you know, just kind of, like you said, prescribe you things. Yeah. Um, have you ever seen American commercials, by the way, when they talk about the side effects of medication? I've seen American commercials and all their junk food. Oh my God. See, I, I <laughs> honestly, when you go to the States, like within two or three days, I get sick. Yeah, right. My daughter. Are you um, still feeling sick now when you go? I, yeah, I mean, I haven't been in a, in a year, but last time I did go, yes, within three days, even though I thought I was eating healthy, I went to the expensive Whole Foods or whatever and thought I was buying all the right things. Somehow, both my husband and I got sick. And then our daughter was with us and she got a nappy rash, which means that her whatever was coming out was burning her skin. Right. How how insane is that? Like, right. And then obviously we went to the doctor. She took antibiotics because her skin was so infected. How old was she? And she was 16 months old. Wow. Imagine. And she had never had a nappy rash ever. Wow. And usually they have it when they're really, really young. That's true. And it was just... I, I read, the, I read the, the, the boxes of formula and there was like over 48 ingredients. And it's like all of this is making us so sick and... What we need to do is seek for someone who's like you, who's a nutritionist, who can actually understand the gut health rather than just keep putting Band-Aids on a wound. Yeah. And I think 
you know, times are changing. Obviously, the digital age is there. We have ChatGPT, which is oh my God, <laughs> pretty awesome. And uh, that, yeah. I'll give an example. Yesterday, I got a um, I got a test result back from one of my clients, mm. and you know, I, I checked out his his blood work and some of his biomarkers, and he he's never had a, a, a thyroid dysfunction before, but his T3 levels were low. So basically, in order for our T3 level, our thyroid functions to be really healthy is mm. we need to have really healthy levels of our T3 and T4 hormones. Mm -hmm. Now the T3 uh, levels for him were low. So I reached out to him and I'm like, hi, it's, have you ever had this before? And he's like, never. And I was like, okay, this, this might be a little bit alarming. So the first thing he does when I meet him today, he's like, Mary, I chat GPT to everything. I checked online and I got super freaked out. Oh I'm my like, God. <laughs> That was his, like, so, him trying to find so, information. So uh, aside from Dr. Google, which most of us go to for, for everything, because the thing is, like, the, the you know, Google is amazing for so many things, but Google will also have the pros and cons of that particular thing that you're asking for. Yes. So it's never going to be tailor-made for you, the answer, right? Yeah. So it was funny because, like, going to chat GPT now to be your doctor and, and, and trying to figure out, like, hey – why do I have low T3 levels and what yeah. can I do about it? Is it alarming? Yeah. So um, it just, it's, it's just funny how um, ChatGPT has like really progressed in a way that people looking at it as a way that they're desperate to want to find out what's the problem with them. They're realizing that we're yeah. not getting answers. No, they are. And mm. I think a lot of the times, um, even you yourself, I'm sure you're, you're a mom, as you say, whenever your daughter will have a particular symptom, it mm -hmm. could be anything. You wouldn't go to the doctor at the initial uh, stages. You mm -hmm. would go online. Yeah. Right? Which we'll all do. Yeah. You know, and you'll try to figure out what the problem is. And right. then you you figure it out. And then you try to buy whatever it is they tell you to buy online or a modality they tell you to do to to um, to give your, your daughter. And you do that, but then she's not getting better. Yeah. So then... That's when you have to dig deeper. Then you go to the doctor because it's like, yeah. you know, she starts coughing maybe or she develops like this uncontrollable cough that you can't manage. Right. So you go to the doctor and the doctor will prescribe you a pharmaceutical drug yeah. because that's what they do. Yeah. Right? And then because you're a mom and because you don't want to see your child suffer, mm. you will give her what your doctor tells you to give her. Right. Right? Right. But that isn't necessarily... The what's the right thing for her, right? Right, Because uh, I grew up um, with a mom who was very much into health mm -hmm. and uh, she is half Spanish. So mm -hmm. she comes with this very ancient way of, of uh, dealing with uh, coughs and colds and fevers. And she'd make all her like little herbs and, and recipes at home that really helped with uh, colds and flu and, and mm -hmm. probably like mild uh, bronchitis. Right. But when you have severe bronchitis, how do you deal with that? Yeah. You take prescription drugs, right. right? And the problem with prescription drugs is that it can help you in some ways. But the thing is, it only suppresses what's actually happening in your system. Right. When it suppresses what's happening in your system, it's only controlling what you currently have. So you're taking the medication and it's kind of putting a bandage on the bruise. Right. And then- But you um, might get sick again. But then you get sick so much faster again. And right. then you're consistently doing that mm -hmm. and you're not treating the root cause of the problem. Unlike herbs and and natural forms of healing where you're really, it may take longer to heal perhaps, but you're treating the root cause of the problem. And when you treat the root cause of the problem, it doesn't come back. So it doesn't come back. So this is the difference. Let's talk about the difference between the doctors and you. What do you do for your clients? Would they come to you and they say, for example- I'm always sick and I'm bloated and I'm breaking out. Uh, what was, what's like the first thing that you do? What do you evaluate with them? The first thing. So first thing I do when I speak to my clients who have all of these sorts of problems and I've had hundreds of people who have very similar situations, not even clients, even people who write me on social platforms mm -hmm. based on something I spoke about that triggered uh, them to write me because they felt that it resonated with them. And they're like, I've been dealing with this for so long now. Yeah. And I've been to so many different specialists and none of them can cure my problem. Mm -hmm. So the number one thing I get them to do because it is an internal problem, it's I get them to do a blood test. Mm -hmm. Now, because we're so different, each one of us, and uh, our gut microbiome is so bio-individual, um, the blood tests are never the same. So mm -hmm. it varies it depends on the severity of the problem of, of each person that I work with. So I get those tests done. And after I get the test results back, I understand a little bit more about what's going on in their, in their gut microbiome, but that isn't always enough. 
right? So we can see what's going on um, within our our cells and our organs and, and how that's impacting our overall health. But also you need to try to understand external factors, which are really, really important. So environmental, mm. like, are you sleeping? My clients are sleeping four hours a night. Oh my gosh. They don't even sleep. That's nothing. That That's, that's yeah, that's nothing. But they seem to operate okay. They think they operate okay. They think that they- But they're they, operating on cortisol, right? They're yeah, operating on a uh, high stress hormone. Exactly, yeah. exactly. You you nailed that. They're they're operating on, on a very different wavelength than people who have had seven and a half, eight hours mm-hmm. of sleep, right? Because uh, they're not uh, craving for energy throughout the day. Mm-hmm. They're not always trying to pursue energy through different aspects of- Caffeine. Of, Caffeine, number one, that's a great discussion on caffeine, um, high fat foods, high sugar foods, any takeaway, you know, uh, the UAE in the Middle East, like many other cities in the world too, it's a massive takeout culture. Yes. So here it's so easy to stop at a petrol station, pick up a, a sandwich or, or grab a donut or get one of those like really high sugary protein bars and be like, yeah. this is perfect to last me for the next three meetings right. before I need to go and consume food. Mm-hmm. But because you skip lunch you know, you don't eat dinner until like 10 p.m. because that's when we're your last meeting. Your entire day has gone haywire in terms of what's going on with your gut. That's insane. I can tell you every single one of my friends has that exact routine. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, yeah. I, I, and I, I would say primarily most people run like that, and yeah. especially large cities mm-hmm. in a very hustle culture. You know, uh, they run on, on on these kinds of lives because they they... They they're busy, number one, they're super prioritizing busy, prioritizing everything. Prioritize else. everything. Yeah. They they can't sleep because they're overthinkers. Yeah, lots of stress, mm-hmm. um, debt, bills, uh, obligations, and responsibilities. Then, so they just put that on the back burner. Always, right? There's always on the back burner. So, what's the most common thing people come to you for? Uh, the most common thing that people come to me for is definitely um, bloating. Yeah, that's uh, that's number one. Yeah, definitely bloating is a an issue because most people I work with tend to be either borderline overweight or overweight, Mm -hmm. right? Um, Then second to that is um, the addiction to sugar. Mm. They just can't curb that. So it's either they just need to have it even once a day, they need to add it multiple times into their drinks a day. Oh, wow, yeah. Uh, You add it into your pre-workout. You're constantly eating outdoors and the problem with eating out is you're never going to be able to control what's the, in the food what's in the food yeah. and is it just me or is food outside really tasty yeah it, it, <laughs> no it's so true it's so true i'm so why guilty. is it really tasty i don't have no idea it's so i'm so guilty when i get a takeout i'm like i just want an easy way out i'm like damn that's good yeah. <laughs> like, now i really want it again so they because they yeah. pack it with a lot of sugar mm. a lot of sodium you know a lot of ingredients that make it taste so good right you know and it, it just really triggers your reward centers and makes you feel amazing for the moment. For the moment. And then, so what we need to remember is what goes up must must come come down. down. (laughs) That's a really important thing that you said. It's so true. My husband's addicted to sugar. Yeah, I yeah, think. he has so much sugar in the day and it's processed sugar too. Like, and he's just going on super like for bits when the sugar spikes go down, then he has caffeine. Right. And that's going to make him kind of get energy or trick him into fooling him into. into How the, are his sleeping habits? If oh, he, he sleeps drinks, horrible. If he drinks caffeine, right? Yeah. So he's just up and then he kind of sleeps, but he's, he, I, I hate sleeping next to him. I actually told him, I think our marriage is only going to last <laughs> if we sleep in different rooms. Unless he fixes his sleeping issues because Mm. he turns around like, uh, you know, like I I joke around. I'm like, you're like a crackhead. What are you? Why are you moving around so much? I can imagine. He's like, I'm not sleeping. And so I'm sending him to you first thing. And he's he's an athlete. He looks in shape. But funnily enough, he doesn't feel in shape. Yeah. He feels like when he looks in the mirror, this is what you see. But he feels completely different. You'd be surprised. Um, I've met a lot of and worked with a lot of people that are looking incredible on the outside, Mm. but actually have uh, various different types of uh, gut-related issues. Mm. Not just even that, just mental issues. Yeah. You know, like they are going through bouts of depression, uh, uncontrollable amounts of anxiety. Mm. They don't know how to deal with that. They're not able to cope with with stress. They need some form of of, um, prescription drugs, um, a supplement, 
a drink, a, a food source, um, a separate type of addiction right. that can really help them cope with all of these things that they go that they're going through because um, they don't talk about their problems. Right. They feel like no one listens. Mm. They feel like they will not be understood. Mm. They go to doctors and no one can figure out what their problems are, so they get frustrated. Which is very frustrating. Which yeah. which is extremely frustrating extremely because frustrating. you spend thousands of dollars going to doctors that treat something else opposed to what you need. Right. And that actually brings me to something super important. So this proves that gut health really does affect mental health, right? Absolutely. Mm. It is the one most important aspect towards the gut brain access. Mm. Now, I like to like use this analogy when I talk about like gut health and, you know, think about this really large home, mm. right? And in this really large home, what's your favorite color? Yellow. Okay. So in this really large home, which is entire interior is painted in yellow, which is bright and beautiful, hosts trillions of bacteria, mm -hmm. right? And there's good bacteria, there's bad bacteria, but they're all in harmony and at peace because we need a bit of bad bacteria uh, and good bacteria in our gut. It's impossible to just have good bacteria. Got it. It's only when the bad bacteria dominates the good bacteria, then we start developing all sorts of chronic illnesses right. and diseases in our gut, right? And then it starts affecting our mental health, our ability to cope throughout the day, our moods with people and so on. Now, um, what tends to happen is um, in this house, we have a lot of rooms because it's a really large house. It is, um, let's say, I don't know, 10 different rooms. 10, 11 different rooms, right? Um, and within this 10, 11 different rooms are different parts of our body's operating system. Mm. The main part of our house, which is our gut, is our operating system. Right. And the various rooms are closed doors, are our operating systems. Now, if you have incredible gut health, these doors open and close naturally with a great flow in sync and always in order and in harmony. However, let's give uh, the brain your bedroom, okay? So, for example, uh, you know, our, our, our bedroom, our, our more sacred place, we sleep in it, we change in it, we do our makeup there. It, we, we make it our sanctuary. Right. It's our place of, of, of solitude, mm -hmm. right? Um, however, if we are consistently um, um, adding certain things into the larger aspect of our home, which is our operating system, not sleeping well, not eating right, um, increasing the amount of bad bacteria in our gut, and they dominate the good bacteria, the neurotransmitters, the pathways that goes between our gut microbiome and our brain gets clogged up. Okay. Which means that what are, what are the most important uh, aspects and the reward systems of our brains that makes us feel good? It's serotonin, dopamine, mm -hmm. and, and GABA, mm -hmm. right? These are the three most important aspects to, to our health. Now, if these are not functioning from a, from a gut perspective in the main operating system, how is it going to go back and forth? There yeah. is no pathway. It's blockages. It's yeah. blockages. And when you're creating consistent blockages in your gut from constantly eating unhealthy, not managing your stress, not sleeping right, constant inflammation, constant inflammation, there's just there's just no um, receptors that's able to go between the gut and the brain. Hence, the gut-brain access is massively important for mental health because if that's going out of function, our brain is not working. We get brain fog. Yeah, yeah. We lose clarity. Mm -hmm. You know, we, 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 we're just tired. We're frustrated. We get angry. We lose our temper. Right. You know, we don't want to go to work. We're, we're sluggish. We're, we're not productive. Mm -hmm. Right? And, and it's because there's so much inflammation going right. on in your main operating system that it's just not able to give the right signals anymore to the other parts of your room and body. Thank you so much for explaining that. That's so interesting. And that's the beginning of a vicious cycle of other things that we end up adding to it, which I'm guilty of, which why I'm bringing it up is like, if I feel that way now I'm, I've, I've created these blockages. I'm here now and I'm feeling depressed or anxious, whatever. 
I used to, maybe some people relate to this, maybe not, but I used to then drink. So I'm like, I'll have a glass of wine each night Absolutely. with some cheese. That was like my guilty pleasure, but I'm having high, well, I don't know. I don't even know what's in wine, but like uh, I would have a glass of wine and then I'm, now I'm having high amounts of lactose as well, combining those together. And I'm thinking, oh, maybe that'll help me loosen up or, or, or not loosen up, like um, take the edge off with the words that I used to use. And then it's like, now I'm creating a, a different vicious cycle of trying to cover all of what you just explained up, but making it worse. I love when people say, oh, at, at the end of a day, when it's a bad day, a hard day, I need a drink. Yeah, I used to Isn't do that. Isn't that always that the case? That was always what I would say. I would do that in my 20s too. I don't drink anymore, so mm. it's it's uh, it's different now. But in my 20s, I definitely uh, find an outlet and use drinking as a coping mechanism for that outlet. Now, mm. um, going back to why people drink, aside from the fact that they're dealing with various different types of these disorders, it also stems from childhood trauma. Right. Now, the traumas that we weren't able to heal when we were younger, right. we end up dealing with it in different ways when we're older. Right. And we're using uh, substance abuse. It could be in anything, right. in any form, mm -hmm. uh, as a way to to help us cope with that. But that, that isn't necessarily the right way to do it because then it develop all these problems and vicious cycle that makes things worse. I haven't drank, by the way. Oh, ever since I sat with you. I love that. I'm serious. I, I love haven't. that. And weirdly, when I started eating a little bit better, I have had a little bit of a reg regression the last two days. If you, you know, if you were my nutritionist, you wouldn't be very proud, <laughs> but there's always all right. room to work on it. It's totally. Um, but I haven't had the drink, but I also felt like I was craving it less when I was eating better. You, really? Yeah. Like I, I would that. definitely want to drink after I've had like a lot of chips, you know, yeah. uh, come have some chips while my daughter's having her dinner. And then I've snacked already on all kinds of stuff before I even have my dinner. And now with the snacking, I'm like, oh, I have a glass of wine, you know? And then by the time I'm having dinner, my stomach's actually already full. So when I took away the chips and the, the cheese and all the little snacks. And I was just like, look, I'm just going to have a dinner. Yeah. And I made my dinner earlier. Yeah. I didn't really need to snack because I was full. Yeah. And then I just didn't need the wine because I'm not having snacks. That's amazing. Yeah. That's so. amazing. Also, you would know alcohols are alcohol. It's, de it's a depressant. It's a depressant. So, it never did anything good for me. So sure. It, you know, it, it gives us our, our high moments during when we're on it. But the thing is, when you're on it, have you not noticed that you're always craving for more? 100%. You want to drink another shot of tequila. Yeah. You want to drink another a whiskey. Yeah. You know, have another bullfrog. Because you love that feeling of being in ecstasy. We're high. Yeah. We feel great. We're happy. We forget. But the problem with that is the feelings that we get after that. Yeah. Now, people, some people experience worse feelings of, of hangovers than others. You know, mm. Some people can cope with it really well yeah. and others don't cope with it at all. And the problem with people who already suffer from mental health disorders, depression, anxiety, is that it makes them happy for a little while, but then it just adds a dent into um, what they're already feeling. Yeah. And they keep poking at it until the wound doesn't heal anymore and they need wow. to find other ways to heal. Yeah, exactly. Oh my gosh. I love talking to you. I'm going to do a little... Um, Quick fire of questions okay. because we're picking your brain. Um, okay. Tell us a little bit about probiotic supplements. Do they actually work or there is a few myths? I don't know if they're myths, but some people say that when you take probiotics, it doesn't really work as well as if you get it from foods. Now I'm a massive, massive, massive advocate for really getting all your nutrients from foods. Okay. Supplements are just a uh, an added benefit to your current um, lifestyle, mm -hmm. but it isn't your go-to to compensate from nutrition. Yeah, you can't have a bad diet and then take 26 vitamins in the morning. No, because <laughs> but that's what people are doing, Yeah, right? Because they think that because we have supplements out there and I can consume vitamin C, the iron, the zinc, I don't really need to consume it from food. So it's no problem. You can pop like 20 pills a day and you're just not eating. Yeah. So uh, people are... Uh, massively uh, caffeine addicted. Mm -hmm. And now caffeine is a uh, mild diuretic and that basically uh, a diuretic is constantly making you want to go to the toilet. Mm -hmm. And when you're constantly going to the toilet, you are then dehydrated. Got and when, when people are not drinking enough water and then you're dehydrated, what then happens? Okay. You're in chronic dehydration. You're in chronic dehydration, yeah. You know, so um, I would definitely promote 
food first. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what's a good food that has pre a lot of and probiotics um, are great from food sources. Right. Uh, so fermented foods. Okay, as you would know. Um, kimchi. I mean, <laughs> I love kimchi. Yeah, kimchi is incredible. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, sauerkraut. I like to make my own. That's okay. all. That's also uh, really good. Mm -hmm. uh, I think those are my two really go to. I, I would say also because from a scientific perspective, they have had uh, a lot of research done on them. Mm -hmm. It's been used by Eastern medicine and Eastern traditions for many years, mm -hmm. you know, and that's still a practice that they do today. Uh, it's also something they consume in the blue zones, which is incredible, right? Um, centenarians and, and, and the Japanese yeah. uh, in Okinawan diets and their culture, mm -hmm. they still consume these kinds of foods still today. Yeah. And they still have uh, people that are living uh, over to over 100 so uh, definitely food first, mm -hmm. but uh, with that being said, food on another um, flip side to that is it's not the same kinds of food that we consume uh, decades ago, mm. right? Because a lot of the foods that we consume today is uh, stripped from a lot of the nutrients that we need in our daily consumption of food. Yeah. Like how many fruits and vegetables can we consume in a day? Realistically, tell me. How many? How many can you consume in a day realistically? Realistically, probably, let me think, a banana, maybe three strawberries. <laughs> I don't know. That's right. And yeah. if you're someone that's really petite or yeah. opposed to being someone really like uh, a bit more overweight or even mid-sized, you know, uh, some people even just don't like fruit. Mm -hmm. They don't even like vegetable. Yeah. You know, like I have to like force feed vegetable to, to my clients. I'll be like... <laughs> Eat you this. Need to eat this. <laughs> <laughs> and don't we yeah. for, force feel that to, to children too, because they just yeah. refuse to eat vegetables. Oh, there's right? no way. Right. And, 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 and fruits are, are just something that people like, but don't want to over consume. Right. Because at the end of the day, it still contains sugar. Yeah. And you don't want to have too much fruit because then it makes you, uh, gives you, um, uh, a massive spike of, 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 um, the sugar, uh, in your system, but then causes bloating in your face. Oh my gosh! You yeah, become so like bloated, getting, yeah. and you be yeah, yeah. It's a uh, it's an overconsumption of of too much sugar coming from fruit. Too much sugar is just bad in general, yeah. mm -hmm. right? But uh, I would say sugar in moderation is always good. So um, going back to what I was saying, um, because uh, fruits and vegetables and various other foods is not just not how it used to be back in the day. Supplements is really necessary, right? Okay, but I would always promote food first before supplements. So, sure, take your pre and probiotics in, in terms of supplements. I believe in them. I take them. Mm -hmm. uh, I combine pre and probiotic supplements with digestive enzymes. Okay. Now, do you know what those are? Yes, I used to take. Well, I don't know what they're consisted of, but I know in Whole Foods they were really promoted, and I was like, "Ooh, digestive enzymes! I think those are good." Now, digestive enzymes is something that we have uh, as soon as we're born, but we lose it as we age. Really? Now, from the food we eat, or no, we lose it as we age oh, in we just general. Eat okay. Right. So not not from the foods we eat. Uh, and because we lose it as we age in general, people are not able to digest foods the same way as they used to. Wow. So as we get older in our 20s, in our 30s, in our 40s, the way we uh, process and break down, for example, red meat mm. is so much harder on the liver really? than it is in our earlier years. Right. For example, right? Digestive enzymes helps you break these better. Got it. So prebiotic, probiotic, and digestive enzymes. Yeah. Wow, amazing. That's great advice. I'm going to need to pick up some digestive enzymes. I'll yes, text you. Sure. <laughs> um, so what are the biggest myths that people believe about gut health that you encounter and you're like, I wish people didn't think this? Yeah. So, well, this is a good one. Okay. Um, I would say the number one, which we spoke about earlier is really important, is um, the impact of sleep on gut health. Mm. Massive. And I think that's even more important than nutrition. Wow. And you can ask any sleep doctor and any sleep specialist yeah. and they'll tell you the same thing. Mm -hmm. uh, because the impact of uh, us when we're sleeping and when we're getting incredible amounts of sleep mm. is you're giving your body enough time to repair. Right. And what does repair do to your body? It heals. Mm -hmm. Our bodies doesn't need supplements, antibiotics, excessive amounts of anything, our bodies heal on their own. Eastern medicine teaches that. Eastern medicine teaches us that our bodies heal on our own. If you give them a chance. If you give it a chance, the right way, right? So the common myths of people when it comes to gut health is number one, mm. uh, not getting enough sleep mm. because without that, you're destroying your gut microbiota. You're not giving it enough uh, healing capabilities, which means it's an overconsumption of bad bacteria from the good bacteria. Uh, 
That's amazing because I hear so many people be like, I'm good. I only need five hours. Yeah. I'm like, mm. how many hours do you sleep? I sleep a lot. <laughs> <So> <laughs> Me too. I have to get like seven is my minimum. Yeah. Because I just saw the change. If I can get seven, I make sure I get seven. So if I can go home early, like remember when we went to dinner, I was like, I got to go home. Are you it's a napper? Like, um, if I have to, I will nap. If I've yeah. been up all night, like when I was jet lagged or something's gone wrong or when I was fasting, actually, I couldn't sleep well at night the first day. Right. In the day, I made sure to take a little gap and actually take a nap, which really did help me. I would call myself a napper like it helps. My, my husband, if he takes a nap, he wakes yeah. up like he doesn't know what planet he's on. Would you classify yourself as someone who can just like be put in any place and just fall asleep? Yeah. Me too. Yeah. Are we not really, really blessed? We are very blessed. Because I know so many people are the opposite of that. Yes. And they struggle so much with yeah. going to sleep. Again, my husband, I'm seriously sending him to you. He has Please like do. all these things that are toppling up and I do feel like it stems from eating. Yeah. I think if his diet changed, his sleep patterns would get so much better. He doesn't sleep on planes. So he has this thing where he's like, oh, I'm great on four hours of sleep. And then he also says, oh, I don't sleep on planes. So I'll just stay up. I'm like, you're wired. Like you're literally running on so much cortisol. Totally. Um, but yeah, I do see it even in my in my daughter. I mean, if she doesn't get her nap, honestly, she's a different baby. Right? Like literally, I'm like, who are you? Yeah, so you cr are cranky. So cranky, so cranky, tantrums. She just acts different. She's totally. delirious and totally. all over the place. Totally. But have you ever um did your sleep chronotype test? No. Okay. So I'm gonna get you to do one. Okay. And then Perhaps this is something we can talk about in another day. <laughs> no, you can tell me really quickly. What is it? Yeah, yeah. Um, but what I meant is your chronotype, you know. Once you do the test, I'd love to get the results and probably something we can discuss in a, in a, in a future podcast. I would love that. To understand yours. Yeah. So um, uh, Michael Bruce, he is uh, the sleep doctor. Uh, he's a, a really uh, well-known uh, sleep doctor in the U.S., uh, author of, of books and and and. and, and uh, developed uh, the sleep chronotypes. Now, the sleep chronotypes are basically um, how we are also very different mm -hmm. and our chronotypes, which is a bear, a lion, a wolf, a dolphin, mm -hmm. there are four types. Uh, just sh uh, but by taking this test, we understand where we are in terms of our circadian rhythms. Now, um, let me give you an example. Like people, a leader in a very large organization, mm -hmm. uh, CEO of a very large organization, will be in a company with like 300 employees. Within that 300 employees, it's different departments, right? right? And within these different departments, there will be people who are less productive and more productive during the day. But then you want to work them all the same way. right? But if you understand the chronotypes when you take that test, for example, I'm a bear. Okay. So I'm most productive in daytime. Mm -hmm. You know, I start crashing like late afternoon and I'm definitely crashed by 10 p.m. I'm out. Yeah. While, for example, a wolf is most productive in the evening. Okay. So when you understand a person's chronotype, you know when to push them more on their best productivity wow, levels. Wow, that's so interesting. And it helps with their circadian rhythm mm. because, you know, there's this whole like, oh, why are you not a part of the 5 a.m. club? Like mm. there's something wrong with you if you're not part of the 5 a.m. club. But actually the 5 a.m. club are great for people who are bears, but the 5 a.m. club doesn't work for people who are wolves. Oh. You know, but it doesn't mean you're not going to be successful, mm. right? It just means that you have a different level of productivity than those who start their day early. This is so interesting. You're so, blowing my mind right now. So, I had no idea. <laughs> so understanding yeah. your chronotype yeah. from these tests really helps you and anybody that you know in your in your circle, your husband, to understand you know, when to push them, when to not push them. Why are people not a morning person, for example? Oh, I need my coffee to feel better in the morning. Yeah. They're just people who are just not. Oh. Right? Because that's not their chronotype. Oh, They're not bears. It. It's not that they think They take that. longer oh. to be able, be able to get through the day and they start like peaking at like mid-afternoon. That's when they start developing, you know, massive energy and like late... Evening is when they're like at their peak. So that's when their brain functions better, their cognitive... Um, receptors are so much stronger they're more creative while us we're more creative in the morning we can yeah. do things it's just these things matter chronotypes wow you blew my mind i never knew that i literally used to just think people just complained about waking up in the morning i didn't know there was a form of trying to become yeah. an understanding yeah, of totally. that that's incredible um i love talking to you i'm that like Oh. Did you did you like it? I lo oh my god, it's amazing. Okay. We're we're gonna go with three more questions, okay. and then we're gonna okay. let you go. Although I can talk to you all day. Yeah, honestly. there's so much there's so much to cover. You know, when so it comes much to, to cover. Yeah.
the most important thing I think in uh, for people to remember and those who are listening to this podcast right now is that you treat the source. It's important to treat the source of the problem. Yes. Right? Yeah. Treat the source. Stop and trying to cover up the symptoms. Stop trying to listen to people trying to tell you that they know better. Mm -hmm. If you don't feel good and they tell you, you you feel there's nothing wrong with you, trust your intuition. Mm. Trust your gut instincts. You know. You know. Literally gut instincts. Yeah. yeah. Trust your instincts. Your body tells you when your something's wrong. Your body tells you when there's something wrong, you're just going to figure out a better way to heal. I love that. Because that's what bloating is. It's your body language, your language of your gut saying, hey, something's up. Yeah. I, I like to look at symptoms as little uh, messengers. Mm -hmm. So there are angels oh. that tell us like, hey, yeah. I'm giving you a little nudge right now. I'm here to tell you, you're not doing something right right now. Mm. Amazing, Mary. Um, so let me know. Okay. There's a lot, uh, hundreds of diets. Yeah. Okay. And there's advantages, disadvantages to each one. I tried to do some research and I realized that literally as much as there's advantages, there's other people saying this doesn't work for me. It seems like people are chasing diets and I know that they need to look into, obviously now we know they need to go for the source and, and check on their gut before they really go into anything. But you're the expert here. So if there was a diet that you would say you would lean towards that works, um, do you like a diet out there that you think works or do you think just kind of generally looking into what you're eating every single day better than going on a specific routine? Diet culture has been extremely toxic. Mm. I have to say that, you know, we have like young girls are like really being put on such excruciating types of, of, of ways of eating because they feel like they need to look a certain way of the person that they saw on social media. But we can never look like anyone else. This is the thing we need to try to understand, right? We can use other people's, um, you know, way of life and the way they may physically look as an inspiration towards where we want to be, but mm. it's not our go-to because mm. it isn't who we're ever going to be. Our height is different. Our genetic imprint is completely different. Our ethnicity is different. Our age is different. Our color is different. Right. You know, the way our... our um, our, our gut microbiome works in a sense that some some people are just genetically blessed to have abs mm. and some people have to work really, really hard, hard to get it. Yeah. And some people never get it all their lives, no matter how they work at it, mm -hmm. right? So I think um, this whole um, box that we put ourselves in when it comes to diet culture should be tossed out. Right. And it should wow. totally not even be looked Promoted. at. Yeah, promoted, considered, because we're creating false narratives, mm. not just for adults, but also for teenagers who want to follow all these adults who are promoting various things that aren't really uh, right, not just uh, biologically, chemically, physically, emotionally, They're right? Just, all of these things. Yeah. It's uh, that's That's one thing. So I don't like to believe that we need to be on a particular diet per se. Because okay. life isn't about a diet. Mm -hmm. I think we need to understand what are the things that work best for our unique microbiome, our way of living, the foods that we enjoy. Because foods shouldn't be restrictive. Mm -hmm. They should never be restrictive, right? If you like ice cream, go and have ice cream. But right? in moderation and at the correct time. Totally, right? right? It, I mean, no one's... No, no one ever died by having one ice cream. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's true. It's like choosing the time and how much, I don't, right? Yeah, no one has ever... Overdosed on ice overdosed. cream? I'll be the first one, Mary. <laughs> no one has ever overdosed on pizza. <laughs> or have it. <laughs> oh, no. I love you know? that. That we could just choose the moderation so, of it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I honestly believe that the right form of, of way of eating is really a way of eating that makes you feel good about yourself. Now that is triggered towards, I would suggest, Eastern medicine, mm -hmm. Eastern way of doing things, because um, I love that Eastern medicine has had centuries of promoting healing. Right, and prioritizing, how, yeah, yeah, the gut. The gut. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, they focus on herbs, mm. they focus on teas, herbal teas. Yeah. How much tea do you drink? Ever since meeting you, because I stopped drinking a lot more, but I, I never love, used to drink. I properly. love that. Yeah, well, well, now I, that I you're just replace a lot it more. Yeah, and I think people are definitely 
herbal tea deficient. Mm. They don't drink a lot of tea. Yeah, that's true. They are more uh, caffeine addicted than right. tea addicted. Like black tea or yeah. like harsh teas. Yeah. The problem with tea as well is like a lot of the, the teas are all processed. Right. So you're not really getting good tea out there. Yeah. And, and I would say the same about coffee. Yeah. You know, Nas Nescafe. <laughs> oh, no, but I know Nescafe is not even coffee. It's like, like 89% what is that? something else. And yeah. sugar. Uh, yeah, yeah, and, yeah, and a lot of sugar. Yeah. That's why I love following right. you on Instagram too, because I feel like you are, um, not only are you giving us these big pieces of information that were vital for our everyday life, but you also show us like little pieces of information, yeah. like, hey, this kind of tea really works for you. Yeah. Like when you did the... Um, video about turmeric. Oh yeah. I was like, this is insane. I would have never taken turmeric or involved. Like I was like walked through the, even the tea aisle and I saw turmeric. I'm like, I don't really know what that means or what right? it is, but now I'm like, oh my God, like this is why, you know, just kind of staying in contact with people who are really trying to find the source and the root of the problem and trying to guide us rather than the pills. This is my biggest message for this podcast. Like, this is why, honestly, like, I'm so glad that you're here. Thank you. Um, Another thing I'd like to add for the diet. Yeah. Um, fruits and vegetables. Mm. Now, fruits and vegetables are so healing. Mm. They're massive and so incredibly uh, nutrients Dense. You know, they yeah. provide so much beneficial uh, nutrients for the body that people uh, tend to overlook. Yeah. And sure, there's the dirty dozen and clean 15. You know what those are? No. <laughs> so the dirty dozen are basically the, the the fruits and vegetables that have way more herbicides and pesticides. So then oh. the ones that are the clean 15. Oh. And that's good for you to know as a mom yeah. uh, in terms of the kinds of, uh, of, of fruits and vegetables that you need to take extra care of when you wash them. Opposed to ones that are not uh, so I've much, you have to of worry that. of it. So when you come to the clean 15, it's fine that you don't buy them organic. But when it comes to the dirty dozen, you need to make sure you buy them organic. Oh my God. How did I not know this? So this is really important. So um, I will send you a list of those afterwards. And, yes, please. Uh, and and um, I'll share them as well. And I, I'm sure you can share a link on, on your podcast for yeah, this and definitely. to talk a little bit about that. Because there are a lot of people out there who are completely ignorant when it comes to, to those. So... Um, you know, like I mentioned earlier, the nutrients are stripped from a lot of the fruits and vegetables and foods in general that we're consuming today. So, uh, buying organic isn't always a hundred percent sure that we're going to get everything, but still organic is still better mm. than, than non-organic, uh, consuming fruits and vegetables daily is so vital for gut health, promoting incredible, healthy gut microbiota, incredible digestive health. Um, uh, and, uh, uh, the functions of, of your, of your gut microbiome. So, um, vegetables too, like anti-cancer, anti-tumor, really gre great for, um, supporting bowel movements, mm. the amount of fiber that mm. we're consuming from fruits and vegetables coats the lining of our gut so that when we're consuming, even we're consuming high fat, high sugar, high carb foods, it doesn't spike your glucose levels. Wow, and that's this is, so key. And this is why I say that it's always better to eat your fruit than to drink your fruit because when you juice your fruit, you remove the fiber. Really? And fiber is what coats um, your, your, your stomach lining when it consumes food not to spike blood glucose levels. So you need the roughage. Because when I juice stuff, I'm like, wow, I've just, it looks like I've really not. You, you need the fiber content. And oh, when wow. you juice it, you strip out the fiber. Oh, wow. And so then why, you're left with and, sugar. And it's straight up sugar into the system. Oh my God. That's, that's the reason so vital. Why. Yeah. See, why did I not know this? And in LA, by the way, everybody's obsessed with juicing. Yeah, juicing. Yeah. But I mean, green juices and all that kind of stuff. Sure. But like, I'm talking about fruit juices. Okay. Right. So yeah. let's talk about the fruit juices. So right. The green juices. Sure. Like, you know, there's benefits to Still, yeah. organic celery juice and, mm. and how that impacts detox for the liver health and stuff like that. But um, I would just say like the, the sugary fruits and the, you know, there's, there's the variables between like high glycemic index, low glycemic index fruits, why it's, it's important to eat on a low FODMAP diet. The low FODMAP diet yeah. triggers the low glycemic index foods so that you're not constantly on a spike. Now, the problem when you're constantly on these crazy spikes throughout the day is as we age, spikes causes aging. It causes glycation. Really? And glycation triggers wrinkles. <gasps> Wait, so essentially sugar is making us old. Correct. And not no just, one has told not us just this. how we look on the outside, mm -hmm. but our brain too. It's aging us. Yeah, it's aging us. Totally. Wow. And it's crazy because these big corporate companies are studying how they can get us addicted to sugar. 
product. And yeah. then once they get us, that's how they ma they're making good products that stay on the shelf is they're studying how can we addict be addicted to that like cereals are literally made to be addictive absolutely and i didn't know this until recently because i'm like what every morning when i was growing up was yeah. like oh Milk, me too. Cereal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Me too. Like mm -hmm. growing up, like I, I didn't know any better. And you know, as a as a kid, you'd love to just pick up a, off anything from the shelf because they're attractive and pretty looking. And there's either like a, a tiger on there, or a little cute little <laughs> figure, or a Barbie figurine, or yeah. or a little toy Kinder, or something that mm -hmm. basically pushes you to want to go to that aisle and pick up a. But also, it tastes really good. You know? Yeah, they it make tastes, it that way for a reason. Really good, right? They want because you to they be sell. hooked, right? Exactly. Yeah. They want you to be hooked. Wow, you're incredible. It was such a pleasure to speak with you. Honestly, it's it's been a complete honor Thank to have you. you as a guest. Thank, Thank you, you Nyla. So much. Thank you for having me. Oh, absolutely. And hopefully we can have you over again. Like, cause yeah. this this there's is no end to this. I totally. mean, there's so much more we can find out yes. with you. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Bye. <laughs>